Hey guys, it's your host, Bailey Cartwright. Welcome to the Stronger Scars podcast, where I invite others to dive deep into the ups and downs of physical and mental scars. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Stronger Scars podcast. My name is Bailey, I'm the host, and I wasn't going to post an episode this week. And then I was kind of sitting on the couch, reflecting on my life, doing my thing. And I got this really anxious feeling in my chest. If you've had anxiety, you may know what I'm talking about. It's just a really heavy feeling. You can't really pinpoint why you're feeling that way, but something's off. And I decided it would be a really great time to grab my microphone and chat with you guys. And today I just want to talk about my story. Um, This is something I haven't talked about in a really long time. I, when Stronger Scars first started, I sat down and told my story, but at that point, it was only kind of in the beginning of my story, and I think it's important to, you know, I want to highlight and promote other people's injuries and mental health journeys, and I think it's important to also talk to you guys about mine, Um, practice what you preach, right? So that's what I want to do with you guys today, and if you guys are new here, you'll kind of get to know me a little bit through my story. Hi, Willow. Willow's in the in the camera saying hi to everyone. Um, but if you know me, maybe you'll gain some new hindsight to my story and kind of what I've been through. So I think the best place to start is high school. Um, I went to a small private Catholic high school and I was really successful in soccer. Um, I was a All-American. I broke a bunch of assists and goal records, had, you know, accolades in the Whippeal, which is a Pittsburgh thing. And I felt on top of the world. I committed to play soccer at the University of Notre Dame my sophomore year of high school, which is, or was pretty common. I know that roles have changed, but, um, you know, things were just well. And I think it's important to note though, like I like to talk about this because I'm not proud of it, but it is what it is. And I I think it's important for other people to hear this is, although my soccer life was in its prime, my personal life wasn't. And I wasn't the best version of myself by any means. I was cocky, you know, for lack of a better term. And I think that reflected how I treated people, how I treated myself. my relationships with other people. And although I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back and do it again, because it definitely made me reflect and grow as a person. I I think it's important to highlight because, you know, for me, it took my injury and it took going to college and growing up to be a better person. And I, I would wish for other people to kind of learn that earlier in their lives. So go to college. I went to the University of Notre Dame and I played soccer there. Or as you guys will hear, I didn't do much playing soccer, but so I first got to South Bend, Indiana, my freshman, right before freshman freshman preseason, my whole class went to summer school. So at summer school, you know, exciting time is our first time being like college athletes. And I started having really weird shin pain. And I went to a bunch of doctors, tried to figure out what was going on, thought it would maybe just be shin splints. And one of the girls on my team was like, have you ever heard of compartment syndrome? No, obviously not. Like, this is something I talk about with a lot of guests. Like, a lot of times your first injury is your big injury. And that was my case as well. And I was kind of, you know, thrown into this whole world of chronic exertional compartment syndrome, which I've since learned a ton about. But I remember vividly that day where my teammate brought that up. And I obviously went to our trainer and the doctor and I was like, what about this? Have you heard of this? And turns out that's exactly what it was. Um, So for those of you who know what compartment syndrome is or have experience with it, you know the pressure test to get diagnosed with compartment syndrome is quite possibly one of the worst experiences you will ever experience. And if you don't know, basically, and 
I want to clarify, I'm not a doctor. These are all my personal own experiences and things that I've learned across the way, and they may not work or be the best for you. So basically for this pressure test, you go in and at rest, you get numbed in your shins. And then I don't know what the exact device is called, but this very big needle, which I'm hoping to, I'll insert some videos and pictures for you guys on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. Um, it's, it's graphic. Um, so beware if things like that gross you out, do not continue watching on YouTube <laughs> or skip over it. Um, but yeah, so basically this big needle goes into your shin and you can literally feel it crunching against your muscles or whatever else that is in your leg. And it reads off a number of a pressure, um, inside your leg at that, that specific compartment. And normal, if you're someone who doesn't struggle with compartment syndrome, your numbers are somewhere in between 15 to 30 at rest. Um, and I remember the first time the guy doing my test stuck me with an with the needle. I think my first one was like a 76. The next one was like an 85. And then we went up to like 90. And this man I never met before just looked at me. and was like, I've, I've never seen this before. Um, you were going to have to like, you know, talk about compartment syndrome. Um, and then if need be, if your numbers are a little iffy, they'll have you go run. And this is one of the weirdest things about compartment syndrome is, you know, during the test, you're literally just outside of like a doctor's office running in the parking lot. Um, and people are just looking at you probably so confused, but you have to get your symptoms to be similar to what it would be like when you're in the middle of a game or if you're running, you want to get your symptoms back to that point. So then they can test you again, your pressures again, see if they rise, stay the same um, and what your numbers would be after activity. And I remember um, running on a treadmill, you know, in between trying to get my numbers higher, even higher. And, um, there's just like blood everywhere because like the band-aids aren't sticking on my legs because of my sweat. And it can be a really overwhelming experience. And, you know, that I remember, I can remember so vividly that appointment sitting in that doctor's office. My parents weren't there. They were back in Pittsburgh. And I was just like, I was so like, I, I don't think I really dealt with anxiety and depression, you know, or at least didn't think I did back then. And that moment of having blood drip down my legs and this doctor telling me he's never seen numbers like that before and feeling so helpless and unaware of what was about to happen in my life. And I think this is important to know, like if you guys listen to the podcast, you probably have an understanding of this, but I think it's important, like, yeah, to some people, this might not have seemed like a big deal going through my injury. To me, it is, it was a huge deal. It is a huge deal and it transformed my life. So if it seems like I'm talking about it in a dramatic sense, to me, it's not dramatic. It's just something that I was dealt, I handled the way I handled and it was a very, very big part of my life and it forever will be. Um, so that is when, um, I think that was a Wednesday, I want to say. And I literally had surgery like the next two days, I think. And so I had my first compartment syndrome fasciotomy, which is what the surgery is called in medical terms, um, really surgery on, I have my notes here. So my first one, August 18th, 2017. So school didn't even start yet. We were just, it was just like the athletes on campus. And I remember I had surgery and it was actually our opening, opening day for, we had our first game. And um, I went to the locker room after surgery, even though they're like, you probably shouldn't come, but I went and I was just so out of it and it just, it was, it was very bittersweet because you work so hard for something in your life, something like playing a college sport. I know so many people out there who are listening to this probably have that feeling, that burning desire to prove to yourself, prove to everyone else that it's worth it, that everything you've worked for your whole life is worth it. And 
you know, kind of looking back now, like realizing that that first game day, I was on crutches after surgery. Looking back now, it it was kind of like a metaphor for what was about to happen. But in the time being, it was really hard. I just felt like, you know, why me? I was mad. I was pissed off. I was upset. I I didn't handle it well, as you guys can imagine. And I don't think that's that's not always the worst thing. Like handling things negatively is how we learn. It's how we grow. It's how we handle it next time better. And, you know, I think it's a lot of trial and error. I think it's a lot of putting our best foot forward sometimes and just getting through something. And I think that was kind of how I approached my first my first go around with apartment syndrome. So backing up a little bit, I want to talk about my rendition of what I believe the compartment syndrome fasciotomy is. Like I said, I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure that in a fasciotomy, they open up your leg, they cut you open, open it up, and in between your skin and your muscle is this layer called fascia. And when you have compartment syndrome, when you work out, or even when you're at rest sometimes, depending on how severe, the, your muscles are working and they're trying to expand. And your fascia is blocking that for whatever reason and isn't letting your legs expand. And the surgery just allows them to go in and cut that fascia so that your muscles can breathe and the pressure in your legs isn't building up when you're exercising. That's how I understand it. If I'm wrong, I it's close enough, I believe. Um, but for someone who's deal, dealt with compartment syndrome, you know the feeling of compartment syndrome. And if you haven't, honestly, the best thing compared to is shin splints on steroids. It's your, from your knees down, your legs go completely numb. You feel like you're running around with bricks, you're carrying bricks on your feet. Um, you know, I've, I've had it so severe that it affects my everyday sleeping, which I'll talk about later. And it can be very, very debilitating to your everyday life and your activity life. So after that first surgery, um, one of the biggest things I struggled with, which was kind of what started Stronger Scars, was dealing with physical embarrassment. So compartment syndrome, like I said, I'll insert some pictures for you guys, but it leaves very obvious marks, scars on your legs. And I've always prided myself to have, you know, a good physical appearance. So having these slashes on my legs was something I really, really struggled with. And again, hindsight's 2020. Looking back now, I know I shouldn't have let it bother me as much as it did, but it did. And I grew from that. So that was something I really struggled with. I know a lot of people with, you know, injuries struggle with is that physical hindrance to their life. Um, so that was one of the big things that kind of upset me, especially freshman year, being on a scooter, people staring at me on campus just because I had the scooter and crutches. I needed someone to get the door for me, I needed help in the dining hall. I couldn't get into my dorm by myself. Um, all of those surface level things. And then at the same time, my mental health was on a slummit downhill very slowly and then all of a sudden very fast. Um, so on the soccer field, I was told that my rehab and back to play would be eight weeks. So I went into the surgery very quickly, expecting to be back on the field mid-season at the latest. Um, and safe to say that's not, that's not what happened. So I went through the rehab regimen and I thought everything was going well and I wasn't getting any relief. I was trying to do literally everything possible. I would go cold, hot tub. I would do extra stretching. I would get leg massages. I would do all of the calf workouts that I was supposed to do. And weeks and weeks and weeks went by. The eight weeks went by, months went by nothing. I was having the exact same pain, the exact same feeling. So my first surgery was done at Notre Dame by a doctor at Notre Dame, a surgeon at Notre Dame. And 
I went to see him for my post-op a few weeks afterwards. I said I wasn't feeling good. And I was told that maybe I was just not meant to play a D1 sport. And I want to stop and talk about this comment for a second because obviously it had an impact. I remember the exact words to, you know, in my life today. And I think that, you know, if you're an athlete and you're listening to this or you're the support system of an athlete and you're listening to this, don't ever, don't ever set a limit to someone. Don't ever set a limit to somebody who has potential to be so much more than you're giving them credit to be. I think this is so important because just because my legs weren't cooperating as maybe they, the normal person who had compartment syndrome was, maybe, you know, the person beside me who had the same surgery, they were back in eight weeks and that's great for them, but that's not what happened to me. So limiting a person to saying that maybe you're just not meant to play a D1 sport, this thing that I worked my entire life for and I'm told in front of my eyes, it might just never happen don't do that. It's really hard. I, I've, I encourage you if you're someone who has been told that get a second opinion because that's what I did. So I went back home to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I got in touch with a doctor who, whom I love. I've literally, his name is Dr. Robert Shelton. So if you're in the Pittsburgh area and dealing with something similar to this, I highly, highly, highly recommend you reaching out to him. He has done my last three compartment syndrome surgeries, um, him. And then there's another guy, his name is Dr. David Stone. And he's more the doctor, Robert Shulkin is the surgeon. And David Stone is this very intelligent man who knows everything about everything about compartment syndrome. And I'm so glad that I found both of them because I feel like they are the reason that I get to live this somewhat, you know, pain-free life. Um, so backing up a little bit, I went to Shulkin and we, we, we tried the Botox regimen, which I think, you know, this is something I did not have success with. I don't know if it was just maybe the severity of it or what it may be. You know, every body is different. Every reaction to a treatment is different. I think that's important to highlight. Um, so the Botox did not work for me. I had absolutely no relief from it. And I know there is a guy, I think this, I wanna just highlight this for you guys if you are dealing with compartment syndrome. Um, his name is Dr. McGinley and he is in Casper, Wyoming. And if you guys look up on compartment syndrome on Google or whatever, you will find his name. He has created this Botox um, treatment that so many people have had success with and he basically just specializes in compartment syndrome now and doing this treatment. I know it's this really awesome innovation that he has. And like I said, I'm not a doctor, but if you guys are someone who may be struggling with compartment syndrome or, you know, thinking maybe you are having those symptoms, definitely look up him. And he has a really helpful website and education on there. And then you can literally, you know, book an appointment with them, fly out and see him and get an expert's opinion. Um, I think with compartment syndrome, it's, it's a tough injury. And, you know, it's so under experimented under, we don't know a lot about it. And I think that's kind of one of the hardest things about it. You know, I remember I have had so many compartment syndrome tests and my dad would always you know, it's, it's a hard feeling knowing that you, your daughter is going through a painful thing. And my dad would always just say like, I feel like you're a guinea pig because we don't know that this is going to work. We don't know, you know, what may happen just because there's so, it's not an ACL. We don't have, there's not books and books of knowledge on how to fix it. There's not a rehab regimen. It's just so based on case by case. Um, and I think that's something that if you're dealing with this injury, you need to be aware of because that's something I didn't know. I thought I was walking into something like an ACL injury where there is a role, there's a textbook on how to fix it. And that's not the case. It's very tricky and it's important to do your own research. So definitely check up 
on that McGinley. Um, hopefully I'm saying that right, but there's a lot of education on that Botox process that, you know, is a, obviously a way less invasive process than a surgery, but I just didn't have any success with that. So my freshman year, moving forward a little bit, on December 28th, 2017, I had my second compartment syndrome release surgery. And honestly, this one went great. Like I remember, you know, I got to go home for it. Obviously that was during Christmas break and he went in, um, may same incisions and he said it went well, everything was successful. He got my, the fascia released and I was feeling really great. So after that surgery, I rehabbed and we made sure that my rehab went slower and just to make sure that my legs were healing. Um, I had a lot of problems with scar tissue, which is a big issue that a lot of people with compartment syndrome have is just because that scar tissue builds up and that can also cause similar feelings to what compartment syndrome feels like. So a lot of times it can be misconstrued that you're having compartment syndrome feelings when it's really just scar tissue from not being broken down. So I, I struggle with that a lot and it's really hard to just, you need to go in and massage your legs Make sure you're breaking up that scar tissue as much as you can. And I, I struggle with a lot of the scar tissue issues throughout the, the last three surgeries. Um, but I ended up getting to my sophomore year. I, I actually got to start the first game of the season, which, you know, that for me was kind of, I remember stepping on the field and crying because I'm just an emotional person in general. Um, but that for me was that kind of this is worth it moment. And not only was my, you know, entire life of training to play soccer at the next level worth it, but then also those two surgeries that I had in less than a year made it worth it too. Um, so that was kind of, I would say that was probably the peak of my soccer career, but emotionally I was not in a good place. Um, so I started seeing a sports psychologist my freshman year and I, I didn't want to see her at first. And I was highly recommended by my athletic trainer to start seeing her. And honestly, it transformed. It didn't, it wasn't a cure all fix all. I think sometimes with therapy, we think that we're just going to walk in and it's going to be, Oh, you're seeing somebody. So now you're fixed. It's not, it's not like that. And I wasn't cured, but the way that I allowed myself to think about things, think about myself, treat myself, treat other people, it gave me a safe space to sit and really nitpick how I'm thinking and how I'm, you know, I'm treating myself. And, you know, one of the things I always say to people is it's so nice to go and talk to someone who has nothing at stake in your life. You can go and talk about the drama that happened in your life. You can go and talk about your sadness that you're feeling. You can talk about your pain. You can talk about literally anything. And unless it's a threat to you or somebody else, they can't do anything with that information. And I think that is, you know, one of the reasons that I thrived under going to see the sports psychologist because I needed that outlet. Um, so my sophomore year after that one game that I got to start I was practicing and practicing and obviously college athletics is a lot of go 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 you're not getting many rest days and you know most bodies can handle that my body couldn't handle that so I started getting symptoms again and I stopped playing. I would, you know, do practices here and there and just not practice as much, seeing if that would help symptoms. I would do rehab. I would slow down, do a bunch of different things. And I still wasn't feeling like my body was itself. So I went back home and I got tested and I still had the compartment syndrome numbers. And I think this is when my family and myself were like, what are you doing? Like, is the test wrong? Is something wrong? Do you actually still have this? Can you live with it? Can you play with it? Are you seriously going to get a third surgery? Ultimately I did. Um, I, I'm trying, I try to 
think about what my mindset and my thought process was to continuing to get the surgeries. I don't know if it was the best thing for me looking back um, for my body. That is, um, it's a really, you know, going through a surgery, the same surgery again for the third. And then as you guys will hear the fourth time, it's hard because you know it to expect. And with my case, the expectation isn't good because of previous experiences. And I think that when I walked into my third surgery, I told myself that this would be the last one, third and final, I said. Um, and yeah, so March 23rd, 2019, I got my third surgery. And I remember there's one moment I specifically remember after the surgery, it was like three days later when I was able to take the bandages off my incisions and Dr. Shulkin told me he was going to just use the same incisions to go in and cut the exact same marks. So I wouldn't have any new scars on my leg. And my mom took one of the band-aids off and I had a new scar. And it's like, obviously you guys know, if you know me, like I love scars now, I think they're sick, but that doesn't mean I sometimes don't struggle with these body altering things that go on, you know, like a new scar to me, as much as I embrace that now and love how it looks sometimes it's, it's hard when there's this new mark on your body that could be there for the long haul. And when I wasn't expecting it and I saw it, I literally almost threw up just because I was so shocked. It was one of those moments where I realized, holy crap, like I just had my third surgery. Like what in the world am I doing? Um, so I rehabbed that one. Uh, everything went pretty well. Um, I was feeling good kind of just going about my thing. And this is something now that I'm like talking about my surgeries and my experience, this is something I think I want to highlight is just, I, I don't, I have a love hate relationship with the, once you're hurt, you kind of get introduced to this athlete injury world of like the athletic training room crutches, like all these things. And I think I have a love hate relationship with that, that feeling of like, now you're a part of the injured athlete circle. Um, and that might be a little confusing how I worded it, but what I mean is like, you know, I got hurt. I had my three, my third surgery. I'm in the training room a ton. I'm going to see the same faces, the same the same athletes and the same people who are working with us. And I, I have a, I, sometimes I loved that feeling of community, that feeling of people who understand me. And, you know, at times that was a really great support system going in, talking to my athletic trainer and ranting or just talking about what I was going through. But at other times it's, it's really hard to just feel like that's where you belong. And you know, I think that some players will have an injury and they'll still get to play. They'll still get to go be a starter. They'll still get to kind of go along their business, but then there's those other injured athletes who are in it for the long run. And that's obviously where I fell. And although it was easy to have that community of people who were going through similar things at me, at times it was really hard to walk into the training room and feel so at home. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm like, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of just how I felt. Like, although it was great that I have this community of people, it was hard to know that that was my home in a sense during my time at Notre Dame. Um, so yeah, my junior year, I didn't have a surgery. So <laughs> snaps for that. Um, I wasn't, I remember I, wasn't feeling a hundred percent, but like I said, after my third surgery, me and my family said that was it. Um, and my junior year was a really tough one for me. So this is something I don't think I've ever really spoken about, but so going into my junior year, um, I went to summer school and I was dating Nick, who's now my husband. And I remember I was hanging out with him. He was living off campus and I would just sleep like literally 
I would sleep all day and all night. And that's when I, that's when I was first diagnosed with depression. And I wasn't in a good place with my friends because, you know, they'd asked me to go out or hang out and I literally wouldn't get out of bed. And I think where that came from now that I've kind of had time to reflect is this feeling of being trapped because, you know, with an injury like mine and with my experience with compartment syndrome, I didn't feel like I had answers. I didn't feel like I had anywhere to go for answers. And when I would go somewhere for answers, it was such an extreme. It was, you still have compartment syndrome, you need a surgery. And, you know, I think it's important to know also, like with my case of compartment syndrome, I wasn't only affected with working out. At this point in my life, from my end of sophomore year on, the pain and the symptoms were an everyday, all, all day experience for me. Walking upstairs were made pretty much impossible. Um, walking across campus for too much, my legs would just swell up and I was stuck with swollen legs at all times. And I was just in so much pain. And one of the biggest issues that I had was sleeping at night. My legs would just throb and throb and I would toss and turn trying to get comfortable. And you know, I literally, I just wouldn't even sleep much. And I think that that depression, it was definitely a situational depression. I would like to think that I don't struggle with that anymore. And, you know, I think where that came from was just that place of feeling so stuck. And, you know, I think that's a feeling that a lot of injured athletes deal with. And, you know, pain is pain. I always say that. I say that maybe a little bit too much. And if you're listening to this, you may think like my injury is pretty severe and you may not have one as severe. You may have something more severe, but at the end of the day, pain is pain. And the way that we handle something that's dealt to us is entirely interpreted by us and us only. And I, I think it's so important to highlight, like, do not let anyone tell you that you're handling something the wrong way to me. The way to deal with that feeling I was having, I thought it was to sleep all day and to not talk to people. And that's just kind of how I handled it. And I obviously got out of that rut and I had my friends, I had Nick, I had my family, I had, you know, this platform, you know, Stronger Scores was being, starting to get bigger and bigger by then. And I, I found those other outlets, but at first, I, that stuck feeling of feeling stuck in my life and feeling stuck in my injury, that's how I dealt with it. Um, so along the way, some more medical terms, um, I was tested for popliteal artery entrapment, was almost positive I had that, and thankfully I didn't. Um, I know some people who've had that surgery, and it is a very invasive, it's like a, it's when your artery is being you know, obviously by the name of it, your popliteal artery is being entrapped and you're not getting enough blood flow. And I thankfully didn't have that. Um, but nonetheless, <laughs> my senior year, I ended up getting a fourth surgery. And this is one I don't, I did an episode on kind of talking about you know, right before the surgery, I did one with Nick kind of talking about like just surgeries in general and you know how to prepare what to expect and those kinds of things but from my own experience this was a surgery for a lifestyle after this after that surgery I didn't try to push my body to its limits anymore I would practice here and there I would do little things I I knew at that point though that that was kind of the one for me to sleep pain free to walk upstairs, to go on walks with Nick and Willow, to do things that I wasn't always in the best situation to do when I was struggling at my lowest points with compartment syndrome. So it was tough because, so I had that surgery March 11th, 2021. And I was the only senior to not travel because that was the COVID year. So our season was also in the spring. So I was the only senior to not get to travel. I 
didn't get to play on senior night. The only senior that didn't get to play. I was on crutches for, you know, senior night. I have a video of me crutching out. Um, I just, it was really tough um, because I painted this picture of myself throughout from freshman year to that very first surgery to senior year. I, I painted this picture of myself of being the hurt girl. And when I sit back and I think about my injury, you know, from freshman year to senior year, it's, it's kind of, it's very bittersweet as you guys can imagine. And it makes me just reflect because, you know, my freshman year, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And then, you know, sophomore year and junior year, I was going through it and I thought it was over. And senior year when that happened and I made the decision to get that fourth surgery for, for a healthy lifestyle, for, you know, a pain-free life, it was, it was tough to swallow because it kind of made me feel like those thoughts I was having in my head was a reality. You know, I was the injured girl. I, I had a surgery almost every year and I was on crutches and most of my pictures and it's, it's something that I come on here and I talk a lot about with my guest of embracing our scars and feeling comfortable with who we are. And I don't always share that side of something that, you know, is very real to me. It's something that I struggle with. And even my senior year, you know, that was a year ago, I was still struggling with, I still struggle with it. I mean, I, you know, both the physical and mental side, like for example, I'm having pain again when I'm sleeping and that's really hard. And that's something that I dread going to sleep sometimes now. And the mental side of it is I still have those mental, you know, scars for lack of better terms of these are things that I've dealt with. And, you know, for whatever reason, I still deal with that anxiety and that feeling of looking back and regretting that that was how my college experience panned out to be. And that doesn't mean that I don't, it doesn't mean I'm not appreciative of what happened to me, because if you guys listen, I think you would have a sense of who I am and how much I truly do appreciate the cards that I was dealt and how I handled them. But that doesn't mean that I smile every time I think about it. That doesn't mean it wasn't hard. I just think that, you know, me being vulnerable to you guys and speaking straight from the heart, not not looking at my notes and not looking at, you know, what I think I should come on and say, and just letting you guys know that like I struggled, I'm still struggling sometimes. I hope that that allows you guys to just have a weight lifted off your shoulders and know that one, you're not alone. And two, it's okay to struggle with things. Um, in today's world, social media, everything's glamorized. You know, I try to glamorize my life sometimes. I'm sure you guys sometimes try to do that too. And sometimes we just need to release that. We just need to say, no, I'm having a really bad day. Like I am really struggling with this. And that's kind of, you know, why I wanted to come on and just share my story again, because like I was saying, like today, I was just kind of having a bad mental day. And I have been wanting to just come on and share my journey with you guys, you know, for a while now. And I thought it was a good time to do it. But I'm sure I'm forgetting to say things that I wanted to say. I just think that, I don't know, I've learned a lot and I'm very, I'm very appreciative for the things I learned. And I 1000 million percent wouldn't be who I am today without my injury. But at the same time, I just, I think it's so crucial that this doesn't even have to relate to injuries or mental health, but whatever you're going through in your life, you only, you know, I think one of the things I think about so much, which is, I'm, I don't know if other people think about this, but how crazy is it that we live in this world where like, we are just one person. Our mind is just one mind. We, we don't know what other people are thinking. And for me, I think about that in a way of like, you know, someone may see me from the outside and think I'm being dramatic or 
I'm letting something affect me too much. But in my head, my injury is such a big thing. In my life, it is a consuming thing. And I sometimes try to block that thought, but I think it's important because that's who I am. I'm a girl who struggled with a really crappy injury. And there were days I let it knock me down and I was a really negative version of myself. I was an, a sad version of myself. And then there were days where I picked myself up and I let that consuming injury loose. I beat it. And I, I just think, you know, sometimes we have to be generous with ourselves. Let ourself, let that thought consume you and let, let that thing that you're struggling with consume your thoughts. Like it doesn't matter from, you know, an outsider, what they're thinking, if they're thinking you're being dramatic, if they're thinking you're letting compartment syndrome be too big of a part of your life, if you're letting injuries beat you, let them think what they want. But I encourage you guys to, you know, after a bad day, if you're letting, if you're sulking in something, if you're having a bad day, if you're feeling sad that next day, do one thing that can help you get out of that. Do one thing that can consume you in a positive way that can help you think, okay, yeah, this injury sucked. It really beat me down, but now I'm going to pick myself up and I'm going to go try to run, or I'm going to go do my rehab with a smile on my face and just find those small victories. I know obviously with my injury compartment syndrome can be really hard to find those small victories. I know a lot of listeners know and have dealt with compartment syndrome. So you guys will know what I'm talking about. But when you have an injury that not a lot of people know about, very physical scars, very hard to deal with day to day, it can feel like such a daunting thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you guys that, you know, it goes away, poof, you get surgery and you feel better with my experience. It, it has, and it, I've also been struggling with it. And I just, I think it's really important to highlight that. So that is my story. Um, I know this is kind of all over the place. It wasn't a very planned out episode. I just wanted to come on and share some vulnerability with you guys, give you a little background of who the person is who comes on here and ask questions to other people. Um, I'm, I will always hope for stronger scars to just be a comforting place for people to know they're not not alone in their feelings and yeah so I think that's all I have for you guys thanks for listening to me talk about compartment syndrome like I said like I'm not a doctor by any means I have had a lot of personal experience with the injury and you know from my own research from my own time talking to doctors and getting tests done all that fun things. I, I feel like I've learned a little bit along the way, but every body's different. Every experience with an injury is different. Even if you do have the exact same injury as someone, no one's going to have the same story written for themselves. So I, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you guys next week.